<laughs> Zero viewers. Okay. All right, so we are live again <laughs> at Miami University, Intro to Asian slash Asian American Studies. Uh, this is our second time doing this. Uh, we had some technical difficulties, but we're joined with uh, with Vanessa Tech and Francis Huang. Uh, I will skip the bios so that we can just dive right into the conversation about the legacy of Vincent Chin and anti-Asian violence in the Asian American community. So, uh, Francis, can you talk about what Vincent Chin both uh, his life, his murder, and the cross-racial mobilizing that occurred after, what it means to you uh, today in your own work? Okay. Well, my um, I, I grew up in California, and I came to Michigan for graduate school, and it was the first time I'd ever been in the Midwest. I didn't know anything about the Midwest. The only thing I knew, really, was that Michigan was where Vincent Chin was killed. And so I was a little bit freaked out, a little bit frightened, and I wasn't really sure. You know, should I come here for school? Would it be safe? I had all these questions, and all the people I asked had no clue. And uh, and so I came, and and everyone told me, oh, it was ancient history, right? That was the other thing. They all told me, oh, it was ancient history. And um, I will tell you what year that was. And uh, I get here, and there were a lot of racial tensions that I hadn't experienced before in California. And so, you know, very, very slowly figured this place out. It took a long time to, to read between the lines, figure out what people were really good. And then uh, I accidentally got involved. With, well, no, I guess I learned more about the case and I learned more about the organization, American Citizens for Justice, and just really wanted to be a part. The more I learned about hate crimes, the more I really wanted to do something. Uh, to make make this place better. I mean, it sounds naive uh, to say that, but that's really what I was interested in. And then, uh, and and then what? And so so now I'm I'm writing, and I'm and I'm still involved. I was executive director of American Citizens for Justice for a little while. I was on the advisory committee, and now I'm mostly writing. I maintain a blog called Remembering This Mission, where I just kind of catalog everything that people talk about or promote. And it's an important case for our community, for our country, really, not just the Asian American community in, in a lot of ways. Are we still good? Can you yeah. Me? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah thank you. Uh, can you. Well, can you talk a little bit more about your work with ACJ? Because, you know, in this class, we read about the formation of ACJ and the kinds of challenges it faced, both within the Asian American community and uh, non-Asian. Uh, okay. Well, well, these days it's very common to talk about uh, our community as Asian American, right? And to have Asian American groups, and student groups, and organizations. But in those days, it wasn't. In those days, there were there were Korean groups and there were Chinese groups and Japanese groups, and and because I think, just because of the, uh, there weren't so many American-born people of, at that time, so there were language skill, language issues, cultural issues. People tended to stay within their ethnic group, and there wasn't really a sense of pan-Asian solidarity around until the vintage. And then suddenly, people realized, oh, it could have been me. I can't say, oh no, 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 it's a Japanese thing because, you know, people can't tell anyone apart. And not that that's an excuse, but people realized it could have been me. And so suddenly, you know, Japanese Americans, Chinese Americans, Filipino Americans, and all the Korean Americans were standing together and saying, you know what, this affects all of us. We can't just say, you know, say it's only that one group, so let's, let's work together. And ACJ was one of the first Asian American civil rights organizations uh, formed. And, and over time, it's, it's done. And it also, the other thing that ACJ did that was really significant was that it reached out across color lines and worked closely with uh, African American groups, Latino groups. Arab American groups and continues to do so today to try to draw these um, connections uh, together. Mm. And you know, in this class, we've talked about uh, previous uh, efforts by Asian Americans to organize cross ethnically, cross racially, uh, in the Asian American movement and uh, in certain labor strikes in Hawaii, as well as on the mainland. So it's interesting. You know, to talk about this longer trajectory of anti or of cross-racial, cross-ethnic organizing. 
Uh, and I, you know, I wonder if my students have some questions about you know, what does that mean today. But I want to get to Vanessa. And so uh, in our previous attempt to <laughs> broadcast the show, I introduced uh, what you do. So you're uh, basically a, a graduate student that does work in higher ed, uh, specifically around questions of social justice and access uh, and inequity. So for you, um, what does, well, how did you come to the story of Vincent Chin, and what did it mean for you both personally and politically? Mm -hmm. uh, well, I have to say that I wouldn't be here um, without Vincent Chin. I wouldn't be here speaking about these issues without Vincent Chin. Um, my family came to the United States as Cambodian American, um, well, Cambodian refugees in the 1980s, um, and a lot of what they did um, during the f first few years in the United States um, was assimilate, assimilate to survive. Um, my mom started high school here in the United States, and she faced a lot of bullying. And um, in order to cope with that bullying, she stopped speaking Cambodian. She um, started understanding what American food was. She didn't pack. Um, Cambodian food and she didn't bring it to school um, so I grew up in an environment where I didn't necessarily know my history and my roots. Um, I went to school here in Denver, Colorado where I was one of the very few Asian faces in my classroom and I, I had no idea I was Asian actually. <laughs> I had no idea what it meant to be Cambodian American. I, had, I, I, I really had no idea um, the history of my identity and um, where I came from and in that sense really didn't know um, what purpose I had um, other than going to school um, and you know, doing my homework and things like that. I, I didn't feel rooted at all. Um, and it wasn't until college actually that I first heard about Vincent Chin. It was my um, freshman, sophomore year of undergrad where um, it was kind of by accident where we screened um, Vincent Hu, a documentary, and it was the first time I heard about it. And I remember I, j I just had this very physical reaction to it, um, looking on the screen and thinking, oh my goodness, like this person looks like me. That could have been me. Why don't I know about this? Um, and I realized how much of this story was taken away from me, um, how much of it wasn't told to me, especially being here in Denver, Colorado, where we have a very, very small Asian American Pacific Islander population. Um, and since finding out about that, I, I did a lot of self-education. I, I wasn't sure why I had such a physical reaction to watching the video and I wanted to explore that a little bit and it was scary. Um, I think accepting that these types of things happen to our community and that they're real is very scary um, and it takes a lot of courage to say that these things are real and that they continue to happen. Um, so over time I made a lot of connections nationally. Um, there weren't the resources in Colorado at the time for me to learn more um, so I actually reached out to the Midwest of all things, um, got involved in the Midwest Asian American Student Union and started learning from my peers about Vincent Chin and how they were impacted by Vincent Chin. And it's because of those stories that I continue to do the things that I do. Um, because this is not a case that happened years ago that doesn't apply anymore. Um, this type of discrimination, this type of hate continues to persist even now. Um, and if we forget it, then we can't improve upon the work that we're doing and build these coalitions um, around addressing issues of social justice and inequity. Hmm. Yeah, thank you for that. And you know, that brings up a lot of different questions about you know, what it means to not focus on anti-Asian violence as a singular isolated incident, but something that is structural and everyday uh, and in some ways invisibilized by the very sort of role and place of Asian Americans in the U.S. You know, in this class we talked about the model minority myth as an invisibilizing narrative that conceals the ways in which Asian Americans are subject to you know, different kinds of violences. Maybe not the kind that Vincent, but more subtle ways like the ones you talked about in regards to your mother, you know, being bullied uh, or not feeling welcomed. Uh, in certain spaces, whether it's a campus or, um, you know, the government or other spaces. So, uh, for today, I assigned two short blog pieces about uh, two incidences of anti-Asian violence that took place at a South Philadelphia high school uh, a couple of years ago. So, um, 
I mean, why why do we not often hear about these kinds of incidences? Uh, this is something that we talked about earlier this morning, right? How these things do happen, but uh, you know, aside from maybe a couple of Asian American blogs, we don't hear about these kinds of uh, uh, systematic and you know very physical uh, displays of violence. So, Francis, since you know you've been in journalism, uh, you're a journalist for NBC News, Asian America, and other outlets. Uh, do you want to talk about the way in which uh, or why anti-Asian violence isn't covered as much in the mainstream media? Yeah, I think I think some of it is just you know who is is there, right? Uh, Asian American, I mean the the way the way the journalism is in the newsroom, there are not a whole lot of people of color, and journalism's been struggling these last few years a lot in terms of just I guess just surviving, and so as they lay continuously lay people off, a lot of the people that they've been laying off are the the most what, what do they call it? Um, last hired, first fired. So the, the most recently hired people, a lot of those are people of color. And, uh, um, and so sometimes these, when these cases come up, they don't recognize it as such. I mean, even in the Philadelphia high schools, I think the administrators didn't recognize that. As a culture, I don't think we're used to talking about race. And, and we're not comfortable with it, we're not used to it, and people don't really agree on on how to talk about race, and so sometimes they just don't recognize. It. I think I think the media doesn't recognize these stories as as you know what they are, you know, for what they are, and sometimes doesn't care really because it's, it's, it's just so far removed, from it. and it doesn't fit with the minority, the or the the stereotypes of what they think is American. Mm -hmm. uh, Vanessa, do you want to address that question? Um, I think it's I think it's hard to pinpoint where exactly this issue is coming from because it's so systemic and it's so institutional. A lot of it does have to do with the modern world. So we're not encouraged to go into these fields where we can make media more diverse, we can make media um, more inclusive. Like when I told my mom that I was going to make education, she <laughs> um, So we value education, but being an educator is a huge no no. Um, so even it's about making sure we're represented in these cases. Um, so in higher education specifically, there are very few Asian American scholars who are speaking about higher education. Um, it's maybe like six to ten people who are talking about how to support API students in higher ed. Um, and if we want to be able to provide the resources necessary for API students, we need to get people who understand the students. So I think even now, um, even though there are there may be like a token API person in certain types of media, um, the stories that are sharing the story may not be authentic or representative of the actual because they go through so many filters, like what's considered the media. Vanessa, I'm really sorry. Uh, I don't mean to cut you off, but we're having some audio difficulty. I'm not sure oh, no. <laughs> where it's coming from. Oh, that was better. Okay. Uh, yeah, me, okay, yeah, you're clear now. Do you want to maybe lean in? Yeah, so maybe <laughs> just be closer to my screen. Um, is this better? Uh, there's some weird feedback. Uh, I mean, maybe it has something to do with your... Do you have headphones on? I don't, um, just because if I plug in my headphones in, my mic doesn't work. I don't know what's going on. Oh, oh, right, okay. Um, yeah, I think if you lean in, that's, that's better. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry that my face is taking up the entire screen. Um, but <laughs> continuing on, um, I think it's just about getting more diverse people who can provide um, more authentic representation in these spaces because they're lacking. Um, one person doesn't necessarily speak for the entire community, um, especially in the Asian American Pacific Islander community where we're so diverse. So it's important to support um, the individuals, which is yourselves, who want to go into a field like this to um, share these stories that need to be heard. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I think we just got a little bit of that there. <laughs> where this feedback is coming from. <laughs> um, but I think we got the gist of what you said. Uh, so uh, I want to turn the question to 
uh, the, the, the question of anti-Asian violence to something that happened here at Miami a couple of days ago. So there was a letter that was written by an anonymous faculty member here at Miami that was published in the uh, Miami student newspaper that complained about international Chinese students here on campus. And uh, I mean, it was a critique that was levied at both Miami University for supposedly admitting international Chinese students who are not prepared for a Miami education and, and just for studying abroad in the US. Uh, but it also, that there were a lot of people who felt like it, it also directly attacked international Chinese students with these very broad generalizations of the way that they supposedly act uh, and, and talk and uh, behave in class and in dorms. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I wanted to give my students a chance to talk about what this letter raised and if there's any way that we can use the tools that we have uh, gathered here in this class in order to understand uh, the kinds of characterizations that were made by the letter, if there are sort of historic precedences that we've seen in this class about the ways in which uh, Chinese and Asian immigrants have been positioned, uh, and if we can connect it to this larger, broader conversation about anti-Asian violence, that you know, is there a way in which we can understand this letter as participating in a kind of discursive violence or a violence of language that condones or permits ways of seeing Chinese students that are not healthy or, or contributing to dialogues around diversity on campus. Um, and uh, so I, I sent both of you uh, the link to the original letter. But you know, so basically, um, I mean, did most of you read this letter? Some of you did, some of you didn't. Okay. So, I mean, just to briefly recap, this, again, this letter was written by a faculty member that complained about the lack of readiness of uh, international Chinese students and questioned, again, the admissions policies of my university. Um, so, I mean, for those who did read the letter, what, what, what did you think, and did it make you think about certain uh, topics, certain themes that we've discussed here in class that can shed light on, on the content of the letter? Yeah. <laughs> you want to tackle it. Changui, you had a, a question? Yeah. Um, question or comment? Uh -huh. uh, I like to, uh, hello. Yeah. yeah, you're good. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, in the corner. so, actually, I think the fact that uh, the professor addressed in the letter is true. Uh, you know, in his class uh, recently, there will be three to five international students, but recently, for uh, there will be 15 international students, and most of them will be Chinese, and the rest will be Americans. And I think that's the main reason that um, makes that professor feels not very good, and that, um, that there will be um, a lot of the Chinese students, international students, that are actually unqualified. And they just came to school, came to class, and talked and responded very well. And um, he said that um, it will be not good for the university's um, reputation or something like that. I think the fact is true. However, the problem is how how he responds to it, how he um, represents, expresses that uh, that fact. Because uh, I think because um, America, I know, is a capitalism country, and uh, and uh, actually the the customers should be. Should be, their, should be their god, right? And um, the reason why Miami University enrolled a lot of the international students is uh, the Miami really need that uh, that amount of money to you know to expand to pay for the faculties and like that. And so when the issue comes, I mean, as a professor, in, I think what he should think about is how to improve it and how to you know. Make those unqualified students qualified instead of uh, complaining that uh, you should not accept those um, students. 
the fact is uh, those students also has already been accepted. They cannot just be sent back or something. And now you read these letters that they are not qualified, unqualified. What do you want to express? Do you want the Miami University to send them back or something like that? Or so yeah, I think that's a problem that um, international students really angry about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Vanessa, did you want to respond to that? Yes. Um, first, I want to make sure you all can hear me. Yes, we can, loud and clear. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Perfect. Um, so we actually have the same issue here at my university, where there's a huge um, influx of international students, and a lot of them do come from China. And our university is having a lot of issues with being inclusive. Um, one, I think that. I didn't get a chance to read the letter, but from what was shared, I think that um, there's an issue in saying that these students are not qualified. Um, these students already come in with certain experiences and come in with a certain type of cultural capital that the university needs to be more inclusive to. Um, and that is extremely important. In addition, I think a lot of institutions make the mistake of saying, hey, these students need to fit into this certain mold to be a qualified student, when instead the institution should be transforming itself to be more culturally aware and sensitive. Because if they are capitalizing upon international students because they need the funding from international students, then they should be shifting the entire campus to be more inclusive instead of demanding that international students fit into this mold um, because I think the same happens with Asian American students where we're asked to you know fit into this dominant narrative of being white and American and that causes us to lose part of our history and part of our roots right so if we're doing the same thing to international students we're doing a huge injustice and in lots of ways that's committing implicit violence right you're making them forget part of their identity in order to belong and that's not okay that was great thank you uh, Francis, did you want to address that? I'm sorry? You said it perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Uh, yeah, you know, I think, again, this brings up the, you know, the idea of violence as not just being a baseball bat or two drunk men engaging in, in a fight with someone, but as different kinds of exclusions, legal exclusions, um, educational exclusions. And this is something that we've talked a lot about in this class. Uh, uh, so I think this is a great way to broaden the conversation about violence and specifically or the specifics of anti-Asian violence and the kinds of racialized anxieties that it brings up in institutions like Miami University right? uh, and the ways in which we can transform the, the institution and its norms of uh, educational and cultural, right? I mean, there, were, there was a video uh, that came out a couple of years ago. Of, uh, it was this UCLA student who famously complained about Chinese students being loud in the library, which is something that was brought up in uh, some of the comments to that initial letter in the Miami newspapers. You know, that Chinese students are too loud, that they don't um, pick up after themselves, they're dirty, right? So again, this notion of uh, the perpetual foreigner that we talked about in this class, uh, the yellow peril, right? And it's you know it's not so much about what these statements say about Asians or Asian Americans, but what these statements reveal about underlying anxieties about America itself, right? And whiteness itself, right? And I, so I think that's why there are so many different kinds of reactions that are emerging because. Uh, you know, it's 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 uncomfortable to be confronted with uh, with one's own bubble, right? Different kinds of bubbles in terms of privileges. Um, so you know, I think it's important. That's why it's important to keep talking about Vincent Chin and anti-Asian violence because it still happens uh, even today. And again, maybe not in physical ways, but in other kinds of manifestations. Um, so I want to open it up back to the class. Do other folks have questions? Andy. Yeah, sure. I just, when it comes to the letter that was published by the faculty, they're real, I guess they're real 
argument, the reason they were even writing was that the students, or they felt that foreign students didn't speak English well enough to participate in class and do well. Uh -huh. Not necessarily that they weren't qualified, they just, they couldn't communicate. I've been to China and I know how big of a barrier being able to communicate with people can be. You could have the highest IQ in the world and plenty of master's degrees, but if you can't talk to someone except for bare basic English or basic Chinese, you're not going to come across as incredibly intelligent. And I think that's what the author was talking about, is that Miami University was about allowing people in who aren't fully able to understand English just to increase their diversity for ratios. Mm -hmm. And that's where his real, uh, I guess, the second one is. OK. Do uh, students want to respond to that? Yeah. Ben. I think it's interesting that you know they would um, single out students that come over here, uh, literally halfway across the world, sit on a fourteen-hour plane flight, you know, and will you know change X Y amount of uh, airports to get here in the pursuit of a higher education and pay a higher rate than the domestic students here. The reason why that some of the underprivileged domestic students are able to study here is because of the economic you know, uh, capital that the international students bring. So in that, in by itself, by bringing in the international students, we're able to admit more students who are, quote unquote, like underprivileged. Next thing is um, that domestic or international, I've seen plenty of cases, you know, being in a science, you know, science major and then minoring in Chinese when domestic students come in abhorrently unprepared. And I don't understand why that isn't being brought up. There's an overall like culture of silence, especially when a professor addresses a class. You know, they ask a question, mm -hmm. and we all know that awkward like five to maybe even ten minutes of silence that follows. <laughs> it's not that hard to answer the question. And if you have the communication skills, why don't you? You know, and I think that maybe uh, for the international students coming over, they just see it as this is part of the culture to mm -hmm. communicate. Because that's the message that we're sending them. Mm -hmm. I think that's that's a really good point, and I hear what you're saying, Andy, about uh, what the letter, uh, the author of the letter, raised about um, you know certain reasons for why Miami admits certain students. But yeah, I think unpreparedness is something that can be shared by a lot of students, regardless of country of origin. And I think that's a really good point, Ben. That you know, if if the sort of cultural norm in a Miami classroom is silence, then why would those who do have language difficulties want to take that leap and speak up when not even American students are speaking up? I think that's the gist of what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, and especially like if you, if English is your second language and no one else is speaking, <laughs> how do you plan on improving your communication skills when you know, that hand isn't being offered. I'm pretty sure mm -hmm. that when students go abroad to other countries, <laughs> it's uh -huh. a very different perception. I know for a fact, having been abroad many times, it is a very different, you know, uh, mm -hmm. perception. So, I don't know, it's just like this overarching, like, culture of silence mm -hmm. and not being comfortable with English to begin with. Mm -hmm. How do you expect these students to go up there and potentially, like, you know, quote unquote, embarrass themselves by mm -hmm. messing up, like, you know, colloquial terms? You know, yeah. Why do we have those expectations? Like yeah. So, I mean, uh, Vanessa or, um, or Francis, did you want to respond to that? Yeah. Um, what I think is there's something to think about. How do we read situations like this? Like, like, imagine you're, you're the professor, right? Or I'm sure similar situations come up all the time where you're at a party and there's you know, different groups of people. Who do you talk to? How do you read it? I've been in lots of situations where someone will just categorize and just, just, I guess, they'll say, oh, no Chinese people came to our event. And I'm like, hello, I was there, and then and so-and-so, and so-and-so, and so-and-so and so -and -so were there, and somehow this person didn't even see any of us, right? And, um, or, or just was too quick to lump everyone in, in, a, in a group. And I think that's where the real danger is. I mean, you can debate, you know, how good their English is and all that stuff. That, that's really not the point. Um, and also in terms of a personal skill, practice flipping things around, okay? Like like Mark Zuckerberg just got all these 
kudos the other day for for doing an interview in, in Chinese. I, Chinese is terrible, second grade level, best. <laughs> and uh, everyone's like, oh my god, he's so amazing, he can speak Chinese. But then if you flip it around, and my friend Ye Song Zhang did this in, in Huffington Post, you can look up that article if you um, He said, but what about all the immigrants that are in America right now, and how good their English is? I mean, it's amazing. You have immigrants of all levels, you know, from from people who are, you know, uneducated and working, you know, working class people all the way up to high executives. And their English is amazing. And instead of, of saying your English is amazing, they say, oh, you have an accent. I can't understand you. Right. It's the same sort of situation, but it's flipped around. And this happens all the time. Mm hmm. I agree. And I, I feel like um, a lot of you all are hitting on very key points. I think um, the conversation needs to shift where the responsibility isn't necessarily put on the student anymore, but on the institution itself. These students, like, I, I'm not an international student and I'm still coming into my institution and facing certain types of difficulties with um, stereotyping. Like I, I've had professors tell me my English is great and then I have to explain to them that I was born here. Of course my English is great. Um, so we're already dealing with those types of things um, and institutions are expecting us to find the resources ourselves to be successful students whereas that responsibility needs to shift to the institution itself. Like, the faculty members are there to teach us and to support us. Um, not to say faculty members should have more to do because they already do a lot, but um, relying on students to do all of their own individual learning is a lot to ask. Um, even now, as a graduate student, I'm in this position where I'm learning and teaching at the same time. Um, and most students, I mean, you're, you're having to learn a new culture, you're having to learn a new language, you're having to learn your class curriculum, you're having to learn how to communicate, that's a lot. So anything the institution can do to support students and take that responsibility off students needs to happen. Mm. And, you know, to kind of bring it back to, to this class and what we've been talking about in the past 11 weeks, you know, we've seen the ways in which Chinese labor, uh, whether so-called cheap labor back in the 19th century or uh, the you know economic capital that international Chinese students offer for institutions like Miami, you know what wh whatever kind of labor it is, it's seen as both indispensable and um, undesirable, right? This sort of contradictory uh, notion about how we want Chinese labor for specific things to have a better gym or a better Armstrong Center, but then when it comes to actually providing the kinds of resources that can help the kinds of students that Andy mentioned, right, who are, who do struggle with speaking in class, which again is not restricted just to Chinese students, right, there are plenty of students who have a problem with both speaking in public or writing, right, like what would it mean then to really take seriously uh, diversity, you know, if that is the banner in which international Chinese students are arriving here at Miami, then, you know, like Vanessa said, shouldn't the onus of diversity, of making all students feel welcome, and given the kinds of resources that are specific to their particular cultural needs, uh, you know, why aren't we having that conversation? And instead, why are we having a conversation about how these Chinese students are dirty, or, uh, you know, are too quiet? or make it hard for me to uh, participate in a group project. And I mean, I think we have one student here who completely explodes the stereotype of quiet Chinese students, Changui. Uh, you know, I, I mean, it's great that you're in this class, you ask really, uh, really smart questions, right? And then there are, you know, but there are other ways to participate. That is not just speaking up in class, right? Uh, so anyway, to kind of, I want to, uh, throw it back to the class. We have about five minutes left. Yeah, totally. yeah I already have a question about the Vincent Chan. And, uh, okay, oh yeah, yeah, Vincent Chan, right. Yeah, yeah, I already <laughs> I see that uh, we don't have much time, but I, I do want to ask that question. Because sure. uh, to me, when I read that, uh, read out the article, that I think um, that's a really like, emotional or influential article. Though I cannot imagine that um, that that boy, that Vision Chen, will be, that case will be treated like that, and uh, I cannot accept for the result too. 
But the problem is actually in the I think in the 20th anniversary of the the, the death of Vincent Chen, mm -hmm. even in the Chinese Asian Asian American, mm -hmm. they have a forum, you know, in for the, all the North America um, Asian Asian Americans. Oh, oh what? I'm sorry. Like forum, like a oh, for, okay. or uh -huh. something like that. Uh -huh. There is n people cannot find uh, many of the articles about um, Vincent, Vincent Chen. Mm. And uh, I think even for Vanessa, right? Who? Um, yeah, I think uh, if uh, yeah, if you didn't uh, learn the select that course, like the major, probably uh -huh. you would not uh, know that news. Know who is the Vincent Chen? Mm -hmm. But I think uh, Miss Huang just uh, said uh, it's uh, it's actually a very important to for for all the not just uh, Asian Americans, for all the Americans to know. But mm -hmm. how would there be a you know? A conflict. One is uh, it's very important to know, and it's very influential. Mm -hmm. The other one is that uh, both uh, uh, white Americans and Asian Americans don't actually don't know it. It's actually not very popular, and it's, I think it should be. So, mm. why would that be? Yeah, that's a great question, uh, Francis. Vanessa, do you want to address that of why the Spence and Chin case is not widely discussed? Outside of maybe certain uh, cities and certain programs, and why it's important to discuss it not just within the Asian American community, but within the entire American community. Uh, Vanessa, you want to tackle that one? <laughs> uh, well, I think it's a greater issue, right? We don't like talking about issues of race because then we have to acknowledge that race is a real thing. Um, and I think we need to get there first to recognize that race plays a part in a lot of these types of hate crimes, um, that race plays in how we interact um, and respond to people. Um, a lot of people are stuck in this idea that we are post-racial and therefore race never matters. But I do think that race is everything. Um, and there's also acknowledging the cultural histories that a lot of our families come from. Like with my mom, um, she experienced genocide. So to bring up anything that um, has anything to do with trauma is really painful. Um, and talking about pain is also very difficult. Um, and whenever I do this kind of work, my mom is always worried for my safety because she comes from a different type of cultural background. Um, so it's it's. I know that there's a lot of conflict um, when we talk about meeting people where they're at, but I think that's important, and it's important to, to humanize those stories, right? This is important to me, and this affects me in this way because of my identity. If we talk about it in terms of legal terms, if we talk about it in terms of numbers and things like that, it, it's hard to connect because those aren't necessarily tangible human things, and we need to we need to focus more on that storytelling aspect of it, right? We need to tell the story of Vincent. Um, I know it's possible to get access to the information because I was somehow able to get access to it. I don't have Asian American studies. I don't have ethnic studies, anything like that. Um, but I mean, there's been a really great push uh, in the for quite a while now to share this story. Like you can stream the Vincent Hu documentary documentary online for free. So do that for your classes. Do that for other students. Have this conversation. Um, the resources are there, it's just a matter of going out and looking for them. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, I would say that the thing to remember about the Vincent Chin case is that the, the great tragedy of the case, the significance of the case, is not that he was killed. It's because that unfortunately that happens all the time. Uh, the significance of the case is that the killers were only fined three thousand dollars. Okay, that they were considered that his life was considered so insignificant that you know that was a sufficient punishment and that part of why that happened was uh his mom just believed just trusted in the in the justice system and i think that's something we're we're taught in school and something that we you know take for granted un unless we start learning this stuff and that's part of why it's difficult for people to talk about or to acknowledge the possibility of this case or Ferguson or you know um, any of those other you know big big cases like if you've been taught all your life that police are good and they help you it's impossible to believe how could he shoot a guy for no reason there must be some reason right, right? unless you've been taught 
you know, sometimes police do this. And, and so it's a very different conversation and people come mm -hmm. to it in different ways and some people never come to it. And so learning about the Vincent King case and about Mike Brown and Ferguson and, and all these other mm -hmm. cases that kind of teaches us that we need to be proactive. Don't trust the justice system, we should take care of everything. We have to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. hmm. I think that points back to the power of storytelling, right? And offering these other alternative narratives that counter these official narratives that we've been given, right, about uh, the police or the state uh, and, and the importance of self-determination, which we've talked about in this class, right, that if certain institutions are not accountable, then that makes it even more important to mobilize, right? And of course, mobilization isn't easy, as the Vincent Chin case showed, but it's a necessary sort of antidote to the kinds of violences that uh, Asian Americans and people of color, women, queers face on a daily basis, right? Um, and to, uh, yeah, just have as many voices participating as possible. So uh, speaking of voices and participating, I want to thank Francis and Vanessa for joining us today. So let's give them a hand. Uh, I'm sorry again about the technical difficulties. I should never touch the screen, because if I do, it just explodes. But uh, thankfully, we were able to reconvene the conversation. So again, thanks for offering your time. Uh, I know how busy both of you are, so we really appreciate it. And it's great to actually meet you in person. <laughs> well, thank you. I uh, hope to touch base again soon. Yes. Thank you all so much. OK, thank you. Bye. Thank you, guys. Have fun with Professor Park. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.